Hi everyone. We're going to continue our discussion on resonance uh, in this video. And in particular, we're going to go through a couple examples. Like, how do you start to show resonance when you have a cation versus an anion versus even neutral molecules can undergo uh, resonance? Now, in a previous video, we talked about the rules of moving electrons to show resonance. And there is one example from that previous video. It was number 03H20. And that example was uh, this one right here. It was a carbocation. And, oh, you don't see that at all. <clears throat> It was a carbocation, and <clears throat> in this video, the previous video, we learned rules to moving uh, electrons. Because you can't just take a lone pair or a pi bond and put it anywhere you want. There were specific rules. Uh, specifically, for instance, this pi bond can only move to the adjacent atom, or it can move to the adjacent bond in either direction. Now, let me just finish this. Rules for moving electrons. The thing is, true, you could follow those rules, but it doesn't guarantee you that you'll get a valid resonance structure. You have to make sure that it follows all the other rules in terms of what's a valid structure. And actually, I think I'm going to add that in this video as well. But let me show you the resonance arrow, or not the resonance arrow, but the mechanism arrow that I would use. There aren't any electrons here that I can move except for the pi bond. Okay? For resonance, you're only, for now, only going to move pi bonds and lone pairs. I'm going to move the pi bond to the right, so I can put a double bond between these two carbons and make this plus charge neutral. See, the object of resonance a lot of times is to delocalize the charge. And if I follow my mechanism arrow exactly what it says, I get a double bond on the last two carbons, and now this carbon right here is naked. It only has three bonds, and you're going to put a plus sign here. Again, you have to be able to visualize where the hydrogens are because that is that is a molecule. But the thing is, we only had one hydrogen on this carbon originally, so there should only still only be one hydrogen on this carbon. Okay, So you can't just mentally add a second hydrogen to make this neutral. You have to recall what the original structure looks like. Because, remember our phrase, only electrons move in resonance, not atoms. not atoms. Okay. Now, when if if I move the pi bond to the other direction, do you notice that what I'm going to get is a molecule with a double bond here, a naked carbon here. Okay, so that's all fine so far. Mm, we have a plus charge here still because we really didn't do anything on this carbon. Right? That carbon still has three bonds and no lone pairs. And the other, well, the most messy part of it is this right here. Why would I put three hydrogens here? I have to put three hydrogens here because it started out with three hydrogens on this carbon on the very end. And we know that that's a ridiculous structure. So when we think about checking if valid. Okay. By now, if you've been doing a lot of practice problems, you'll realize that organic chemistry is a lot of trial and error. Even if uh, you're a professor or even if you've been doing this for you know 30 plus years, a lot of times it's going to be trial and error quickly and just say, oh, I tried this, it doesn't work, let me push the electrons to the right because it doesn't work in this case because of uh, several things. And let me show you what those things are. 
you want to check if your result is valid by making sure that there are no uh, five bonded carbons. Okay. Sometimes they call this a Texas carbon because um, it makes the shape of the star of Texas. Okay. No Texas carbons, please. The next thing is, um, honestly, you don't want like charges next to each other because you have very severe charge repulsion. No severe charge repulsion. Got to make sure you don't have that. For instance, again, I'm just going to draw an example here. Like charges repel. Okay. And then the last thing is, and I don't think we have an example here, but all non-hydrogens and non-carbons that are carbocation, all those other atoms have to fit the octet rule. Okay, this is going to be very important because if you're like me and you do a lot of trial and error to find the right uh, combination of arrows. I'm always checking these three things. Okay, no five bonded carbons, no severe charge repulsion, and all the atoms that are not hydrogen or a carbon, that's a carbocation, all of those other atoms have to fit the octet rule. This will save you from many errors, I believe. Okay. Um, all right. Next is, let me take a look at what's next actually. So that's reasonable, valid resonance structures, how to check for them. Uh, we haven't done anionic examples or neutral examples. And we haven't talked about major contributors. And actually, the example that I showed just now, we can pick what's called a major contributor. Now, before we take a look at that example, this example right here, okay, there's a major contributor in this case. Um, let me just remind you this idea about resonance and that actually the resonance structures that you draw are imaginary. But there are great representations of the real molecule and they're easier to draw than the resonance hybrid. Because the resonance hybrid, uh, you'll most likely have to draw dotted lines because you have bonds that are sometimes single, sometimes double. Um, and then also, your remember, resonance is used to show delocalization of charge. So now you're going to have to either use partial charges or some other type of notation to show that that charge has been spread out. That's the rhinoceros. That's kind of messy to draw. So we do accept Lewis structures or the resonance contributors even though they don't actually exist. <clears throat> They're just very good line representations or structure representation of the actual molecule. Okay. Major contributors. If this hybrid looks more like, let's say, ah, the unicorn. It has a bigger horn, it's, um, it doesn't have, it has smaller wings. You would say that, oh, the rhinoceros takes after the unicorn more than the dragon. It's almost as if you can say that um, in terms of, I don't know, the shape of the nose of a, a, of a child. You've heard that before. Oh, you have the nose of your dad or you have the eyes of your mom. Well, that means that one of the resonance contributors contributes more to that feature than the other. So even though the resonance hybrid is a, is a complete combination of the two or more structures, it can lean towards one over the other. And in this case, we can pick out a resonance, major resonance contributor. Okay. So let me draw those two again. Okay, very easily. Make sure you show that it's resonance and you're not just flipping or rotating the molecule. But because this is secondary allylic, and we did describe allylic carbons in the previous video, 03H20, 
and this is primary. Yeah, this one is more stable, and our conclusion would be this is the major contributor. Okay. And in this video, we're going to go over other rules to show major contribution, what you want to look for. And then just for completeness, um, let me draw you the resonance hybrid, the combination. The charge is spread between actually these two carbons, the one here on the second carbon and here on the end. So we're going to draw, hmm, I, I like to draw partial charges if I'm drawing a resonance hybrid. Because that one plus charge is spread out. Now, because this is the major contributor, you could almost say that, well, you could say that maybe this has mm, like an 80% plus charge and this has a 20% plus charge. They're both positive, just as one is more positive than the other. And then when you think about the bonds specifically, between carbon 2 and 3, it's a double in this case, and here it's a single. So on average, it's going to be one and a half, and also it's going to be one and a half between carbon three and four. Okay. All right. Let me go over an anion example. <clears throat> We've seen actually an anion example in the previous videos. Um, let me show you one here. Let me pick one out here. But before I do that, um, let me just, one last thing. These are going to be tips. For the cation example, the tip is try moving a pi bond to neutralize some plus charge. Okay. And that example again is this one right here. We don't neutralize the whole molecule, but by moving these electrons of the pi bond to the right, we neutralize this plus charge right here, and we spread it out. That's the tip that I would use. Look for a pi bond that is next to a plus charge and uh, try moving it to neutralize that plus charge. Anion. Okay. Try moving a lone pair on the negatively charged atom. And I'll show you that example. Oh, let's try this one here. Let's have a carbon ion. Okay, I know I'm mixing up Lewis structures and um, condensed and uh, line structure. Okay. But I want to show this carbon uh, explicitly because I'm going to make it an anion. You know, another tip is if you're not that uh, familiar with resonance, why don't you draw all the lone pairs? Okay. And that way we can keep track and we could do our formal charge equation to find any formal charges on any atoms. The, tip was to try moving a lone pair on a negative atom. So let's do this. You know, do you see how I could move the lone pair to the right, but I would get a double bond to hydrogen. We know that's incorrect. Okay. So we're going to move it to the left. When I move it to the left, if you visualize what's happening, if I stop right now, there's going to be a double bond between the dot and the carbon. And the double bond here stays, and the single bond here stays. We have a five-bonded carbon. But the beauty of this is that we can resolve that right now by moving this pi bond to the atom. Okay. Remember, the pi bond can move to the adjacent bond or to the adjacent atom. A lone pair can only move to the adjacent atom. Oh, sorry, adjacent bond. Again, uh, those rules, those are rules. There's really only three of them. Those are in video 03H20. What is our result? Our result is this. I should have given you some time to draw the result yourself. So you could draw it like that. 
that carbon still has two hydrogens, right? Or you could draw the C with the two hydrogens if you want, but that's perfectly fine. Okay, these are pretty different, right? These are pretty different, and actually, let me redraw it. So, how how would I draw it? Eventually, you're going to have to know and how to interpret a drawing like this, because it's an anion. You know that that carbon has three bonds and one lone pair. That is just uh, rep practice figuring out charges on atoms. Okay. If you're in doubt, go ahead and draw what how many hydrogens you think are on this carbon to make sure that that's a negative. Okay. The other thing is, well, honestly, I didn't have to put the lone pair. I could have just given you the minus charge, and then it's the student's responsibility to draw all the lone pairs. But if I'm going to draw a lone pair, maybe I put it right here. Okay. That's perfectly fine. I know the lone pair and the minus charge belong to this carbon. Can I still do resonance or mechanism errors on a drawing like this? Yes. There. There. I'm drawing the lone pairs typically on any atoms that are charged. And we have to be confident that this carbon now is neutral because now it obtained a, a fourth bond. This has a resonance contributor. So let me give you some rules on how to choose the major contributor. Now would be a good time. We already have an, an inkling on how to do that. You pick the more stable representation of the structure. This is secondary allylic, this is primary allylic. But let me give you a couple more rules, and they're going to be in order, meaning that if you can decide the resonance contributor based on rule number one, you don't need to go to rule number two, three, and four. It's only if it's a tie for a rule that where you go on to the next one. So for the major contributor, I'm going to list, list features of a major contributor. The one with more, no, that's the second rule. Um, let me put one here actually. No. The one with all non H and non carbocation atoms fit octet rule. Carbocation carbons, we were told a while ago that they are they do exist even though it doesn't fit the octet rule. This is one of the few examples where an atom is okay to have and you can isolate intermediates that have that atom even if that atom doesn't have the full octet. There are other examples, but this is the major example. Now the thing is, both of these structures all the carbons and oxygens, they do fit the octet rule. So we got to go to rule number two. And we're going to pick the one with more covalent bonds. We have a winner. No. Do we have a winner? Oh, no. We don't have a winner. So we have the same number of carbon-hydrogen bonds in both cases. So what I'm really looking at is, well, do we have a net change? But you see that every time we make this bond here, we have to break a bond. So there is no net change, and these two have the same number of covalent bonds. Do you see the shortcut that I did? I'm not literally counting every single covalent bond. I'm seeing what the change is. And every time I add this one, I have to break this one. Even if I go backwards, if I make the pi bond again, I have to break this pi bond. So that's not going to help us. Hmm. This was a good example because it's making us consider a lot of different rules. Because right now the first two are tie. They both have, uh, they both have, uh, they both satisfy these two rules. 
Number three, the one without separation of charge. We don't have separation of charge here. Let me show you an example before I tell you the rule number four, the one that's going to help us decide. Separation of charge looks like this. And actually, this is our first case where we have a, a neutral molecule. Believe it or not, this has a resonance structure, but it's kind of minor. But it's still an important one. It's still an important one, which is this. We learned that this was called a carbonyl group. And carbonyl groups have resonance. And if I draw all the lone pairs and the charges, we realize we have a neutral molecule turning into a molecule that's still neutral but has a separation of charge. This is what they mean by separation of charge. And again, this is good because this is our first example of something that's neutral. Okay. Separation of charge, one minus one plus typically. They don't necessarily have to be next to each other. There are examples where they're distant. The thing is, that rule doesn't apply here because we have no separation of charge. We only have a minus charge on each one. So the last rule is going to help us decide. It's the one where a negative charge is on the more electronegative atom. If I take a look at this example, the only difference is the, well, not the only difference, but the charge, there's a big difference. We have a charge on the carbon here and a charge on the oxygen here. Oxygen is more electronegative. This is for major. So how do I want to do this? Um, well, I'll just redraw it. Eventually, in, in literature, you don't have to draw the lone pairs. You do have to draw any charges so that they exist, because that will tell the reader, oh, how many lone pairs it should have. But normally, well, you don't necessarily have to draw a lone pair. I just, for my class, I just make them draw all the lone pairs at the beginning so it becomes automatic. Because when I see something like this, I and probably you already automatically see three lone pairs. Oxygen with one bond is going to be minus with three lone pairs. Okay. Also, you, you know that you could fit in three lone pairs to complete the octet rule. Okay. So that's another trick. If you're trying to figure out or predict how many lone pairs, just complete the octet rule. Okay. okay. So those are the rules. Um, we have to go to rule number four, which is great, because we considered each of these. This one has a separation of charge, okay? But do you notice that we could have picked the major contributor by rule number two, the one with more covalent bonds? So let me circle this one. So this one's the major. And technically, we use rule number two, even though we could also use rule number four, but two comes first. Okay, so this molecules still is following, still follows rule 2 and 4 anyway. Oh, not 4, 3. The one without separation of charge, 2 and 3. Rule number 4 was uh, had to be used to figure out that this one was the major. Okay. So that's the rules to choose a major contributor. We've gone over an example with cations. We've gone over one example with anions. Let me show you, oh, and we have one example that's neutral. Let me show you one classic, very, very classic example of a neutral molecule undergoing resonance. And it's going to be being, it's going to be using the benzene ring. And I'm going to add two groups actually, two chlorines. You notice between these two carbons that there's a single bond. 
the resonance is kind of weird here. We're just going to rotate every single double bond one over. And you could go counterclockwise or clockwise. It doesn't matter. But look at my result. Or can you draw the result based on my mechanism arrows? If you want, you could pause and draw the result of these arrows. If you follow my mechanism arrows, exactly what they're telling you, for instance, this pink arrow on the right is telling you to move the double bond to be between the two dots. Okay, I can do that. Move this double bond between the two carbons on the left. Okay, and then the last double bond shifted this way. Ultimately, what happened is we make no charges. We go from a neutral molecule to a neutral molecule. Remember that in resonance, atoms don't move, so the chlorines still have to be on those two dots. What's interesting about this example is that I am showing you that we have two resonance structures, and they're different because in this case, there's a single bond between the two dots, and in this case, there's a double bond between the two dots. There is no major contributor here. I would say that these contribute 50-50. Okay. There may be some slight difference, but for the most part, our four rules don't really help us in choosing a major contributor. So we'll just say uh, contribution is around 50-50. The thing about this is, if you th if you realize, or if you truly understand this picture, this is from Bruce's Organic Chemistry textbook, you could say that, well, neither of these two exist. These two are imaginary, and they are imaginary. There's no way that you could get compound A and compound B in the same jar. There's no way that you can get compound A exclusively or compound B exclusively. There is no molecule that if you freeze it looks like these two, any of these two. A hundred percent of the time, and this is what I want you to know about resonance, well, one of the major things to know about resonance, a hundred percent of the time it's not either A or B, it's a hundred percent the hybrid. And how would you draw a hybrid in this case? The hybrid in this case is that all carbon-carbon bonds are identical. They're all one and a half, and you would draw it like this. Okay. And two carbons. You might have seen, actually, in textbooks or online, that benzene, right, benzene can look like this, or benzene can be drawn like this. Why? I don't like this, and a lot of professors don't like this because they don't literally see three pi bonds. Because, again, the most important question in organic chemistry is where are the electrons? So we actually have, have experience and know that there are six pi electrons, two, four, six. This is because it's showing that the pi electrons are delocalized. But I would never draw this. Okay. I would I would go ahead and take the time to draw all the pi bonds, just like a valid normal line structure. Okay. There are many more examples. Obviously, uh, this is not going to be automatic until you do many many examples, because not only do we want to practice with cations and anions and neutral. But also, we haven't done any examples so far that have nitrogen, okay? Uh, we haven't done examples where oxygen becomes positively charged. I have a whole set of molecules in mind uh, that I can show uh, in a future video. But again, check your textbook, check your practice problems that your professor gives you, and see if you can apply these rules. How do well, the first rule is, you know, do you know how to draw electrons to show resonance? And then the second set of rules is how to choose a major contributor.